You're not fit to wear the shirt. That's the chant some football fans often make to underperforming football players. In fact, this was chanted to fans of the English Premier League Manchester United club, Manchester United, to their players when they lost 4-0 to Brighton last year. Now, personally, I quite like that result. I always like seeing Manchester United get thumped by the underdog. But the, the fans chanted, you're not fit to wear the shirt because they felt that the player's performance was not worthy of their team. Their behaviour on the pitch was not appropriate for someone representing their club. Indeed, this question was asked of one of the Manchester United star players, Bruno Fernandes, after the match, and he agreed that after that performance, even he wasn't worthy of the shirt. For there is a sense of, of worthiness, of appropriateness of behaviour when a player puts on their shirt to represent the football club. Wearing the shirt brings a sense of expectation of how you should perform. You're meant to, to demonstrate some pride, give your all for the club, work hard and show some passion. It can even mean, like in a strange situation which happened to the English football team that I support, Everton, last year, which was actually dreadful, that some of the fans actually wanted their own player sent off because he wasn't deemed worthy of the shirt. The shirt stands for all that is good about the club. The shirt stands for something bigger, something more, something to inspire activity and action. But it's not just football. Some have said that Nick Kyrgios, for example, is not worthy to represent Australia in international tennis. And some politicians, some have thought that them, like perhaps Donald Trump, is not worthy to represent their constituency or their nation. Because when you represent something bigger than yourself, a football team, a city, a state, a, a country, there is an appropriateness to how you behave. So what about when someone represents the gospel of Jesus Christ? What sort of behaviour would be appropriate for someone to wear the shirt of Team Jesus? What would constitute an appropriate way to live? Well, this is actually what Paul explores in the next part of the book of Philippians. Because he says there in verse 27, Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. So what is a worthy life of the gospel of Jesus? What does the Philippians do to be worthy, to don the shirt of Jesus? Well, in this section, he first explains some elements of a worthy life in the face of opposition. Then he provides an unexpected reassurance in light of this opposition that their suffering is actually a gift. And then he proceeds to expand further on some specific virtues of the worthy life, giving them a beautiful vision of the Christian life. And so Paul starts this little section by encouraging the Philippians that whatever happens, there is one thing you need to be aware of. They are to conduct themselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. For he's writing to the church in Philippi and they are experiencing some form of opposition. If you look there in verse 28, we're not sure exactly what this opposition is. Maybe it's connected to those who preach Christ out of um, selfish ambition. We're not sure. But these opponents were causing suffering and difficulty to the Philippians. So Paul encourages the Philippians to, there to not be intimidated by them. In fact, he writes that in the face of this opposition, they're to live as worthy citizens of Christ. They are to live appropriately when representing the shirt. So what are they to do specifically? Well, in spite of the opposition, see there in verse 27, that regardless of whether Paul sees them or not, they are to live as worthy citizens. He says, I know that you stand firm in, one, in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. Being a worthy citizen of the gospel means Standing together in unity. In spite of the opposition facing the church in Philippi, they are to stand firm, striving together. There is solidarity in facing opposition. And Paul's rousing expectation, sorry, exhortation here feels a bit similar to one of the world's great modern speeches. That given by Winston Churchill to the British Parliament in 1940, when the threat of the Nazi invasion of Great Britain when the Second World War was most acute. Churchill then said, I, I probably can't do his voice properly, but I'll, I'll give it a go. He says, the British Empire and the French Republic linked together in their cause and in their need 
will defend to the death their native soil, aiding each other like good comrades to the utmost of their strength. We shall go on to the end. We shall fight in France. We shall fight on the oceans and seas. We shall fight with growing confidence and growing strength in the air. We shall defend our island, whatever the cost may be. We shall fight on the beaches. We shall fight on the landing grounds. We shall fight on the fields and in the streets. We shall fight in the hills. And we shall never surrender. Churchill was encouraging and emboldening the English people to stand together in the face of opposition. He called for unity and solidarity in the face of the odious apparatus of the Nazi rule. This was what it meant to be a worthy British citizen, to stand and defend the British Isles, whatever the cost may be. And Paul here in Philippians rouses the believers to stand with great tenacity for their faith. Yet whilst Churchill motivated and united the British people with their with their common enemy, notice how Paul motivates and unites the Philippians. Their solidarity doesn't come just from fighting against a common enemy or happening to be of the same nationality. It's a far deeper and a far more profound connection that the Philippian believers have with each other. If you look there in verse 27, I know that you will stand firm in one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. They are united in spirit, with the same mind, the same soul, striving together. Genuine unity, contending together for the faith of the gospel. Now it's unclear here whether Paul means that they are sharing the one Holy Spirit, or just one common human spirit, but the effect is similar. They're deeply connected and united in the faith. They share this faith, this common bond, and it galvanizes the believers together to stand to face opposition. The struggles of the Christian citizen are faced within the fellowship of the, Christ, of, of the believing community. So this is what it means to be a worthy citizen of the gospel, standing together and contending for the one gospel in spite of opposition. But then Paul provides some sobering, but also some good news. For their standing for the gospel in face of op opponents is actually a sign of their opponent's destruction and simultaneously their salvation. It's similar in some sense to the way Churchill stood against Nazi Germany. By him standing, by remaining resolute, in some sense that the Nazis couldn't win. So here we see that in some way, perhaps in a spiritual battle kind of way, the perseverance and solidarity of the believers in Philippi foreshadows and assists in the destruction of their enemies. They will really remain standing. So Paul has exhorted the believers to live lives worthy of the gospel, worthy of the shirt, so that they may stand together and contend for one gospel in spite of opposition. But standing in the face of opposition is difficult. It means challenge and difficulty Withstanding opposition will mean suffering. So then Paul provides an unexpected reaction and reassurance to the suffering. And we see it in verse 29. For it is being granted to you on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. In light of the opposition and the challenges they're facing, to stand against it will mean suffering. But Paul then says that two things have been given to the believers as a gift. The first is the gift of faith, to believe in Christ. Entering a relationship with Christ and to be with him is a gift. It's not earned or inherited. It's a gift given to those who believe. Then the kicker is that as well as being saved by grace, believers are also being given suffering by grace. For it is granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. The opposition and suffering that the church was experiencing was actually given to his followers by grace as a gift. Now, you might pause here and wonder if this is some kind of cruel dad joke. You know, gee thanks dad, I wanted some donuts, but all you gave me was some, some salad, you know. Or, well here's a lovely lolly grape you know or what's that special custard that you've put in my birthday donut you know i mean 
Because Paul says here that the Philippians have had the privilege, they've been given the gift of suffering. Now it's clear that the particular suffering that Paul considers a gift is actually suffering for the sake of Jesus. He's not speaking about more general suffering. He's not calling cancer or my health problems a, a gift. Now he's saying here that suffering for Jesus, it's a gift that belief in Jesus corresponds with suffering for him. Now people in our culture would struggle to see suffering, any form of suffering, as a gift. Because our, our culture actually struggles to grasp with suffering at all. Suffering in our culture is an aberration and needs to be eliminated at all costs. But here, Paul is giving purpose to their suffering and reassures the Philippians that though there is opposition to belief in Jesus, it's a privilege to suffer for him. Now we could ask, if, if God's real and if he cares, why doesn't God protect his people? Why does he give them the gift of suffering for him? Well, the, the precise reason for this is not clear from this particular passage, but suffering for Jesus' name follows the same path as Jesus himself. For Christ suffered for proclaiming the truth. The world hated him so much so that he was crucified. And because we bear the name of Jesus, the world will hate us. And to suffer for Jesus is essentially to walk the same path as Christ himself. In fact, one Chinese pastor who was repeatedly beaten and imprisoned for his faith said, Christ was the first to suffer but we just follow him. So consider other parts of the New Testament, such as after the apostles were beaten up by following Jesus in Acts 5. The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. In some sense, their suffering was a gift. It was a privilege to suffer for Christ. Believers had been given the gift of not only believing in Christ, but suffering for him. Now, it's no doubt been a difficult couple of weeks for Andrew Thorburn. I mentioned him last week. You might have heard that he was forced to resign as the CEO of Essendon Football Club because of his Christian faith. And it must have been a tough, tough week for, his, for him because his character, his history, his flaws, his allegiances, his prejudices, his motivations, they've all been examined, debated, dissected and discussed. There have been a range of opinions about Andrew Thorburn and many Christians have pushed back and, and have highlighted the discrimination, hypocrisy and inconsistency that the media has and those, about the, of the media and those in power. But in all of the commentary and discussion, I haven't seen any Christian ever say that maybe his sufferings are a gift. Granted to Andrew to suffer for Christ. Now, it, his sufferings are probably no, are nothing, probably nothing compared to what the Philippians are experiencing here. But maybe the Apostle Paul might just recalibrate our opinions a bit. Maybe Paul would say to Andrew Thorburn, stand. Stand unified with other believers in face of opposition. For it's been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. Maybe this is what it means to live as a life of, as a worthy citizen of Christ. I want to talk to you about an unusual gift, said the Chinese father to his beautiful black haired daughter. She smiled with anticipation. She loved it when her wise father shared special lessons about God. He loved Christ, and everyone knew him, everyone who knew him was touched by his kindness and compassion. He opened a worn Bible and began. This gift is found in Philippians 1:29. It says for it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for him. Something that is given to us as a gift. The two gifts in this verse are belief and suffering. Suffering that results from our belief in God as a precious gift, the value of which will be fully realized in heaven, only in heaven. The daughter smiled and said, thank you, Papa. As she reached up to hug him, I understand. And this young girl grew up to become the wife of Pastor Li Dijian, who has been arrested countless times and nearly beaten to death for his faith. She carries on the work with him, persevering because she learned at a young age that godly suffering for the name of Christ is a gift. 
Pastor Li and his wife have won countless souls to Christ in communist China and they continue to work under a constant threat of arrest. Now I read this story in the Voice of the Martyrs website. This pastor, Pastor Li, was the same Chinese pastor who said, Christ was the first to suffer, but we just follow him. Belief in Christ and suffering for him go together. Believers have been given the unusual gifts of not only believing in Christ, but also suffering for him. So then after encouraging believers to stand, unified in the face of suffering, Paul starts his next section with therefore. Now a preacher once said to me, whenever you see a therefore, you need to ask, what is the therefore, therefore? And so Paul's comments in the next verse flow logically from what's just happened. Standing firm and suffering for Christ, so therefore, as you stand and suffer, Paul then articulates specific virtues about the worthy life, worthy as a citizen of Christ. He draws upon some deep truths of the faith to draw a connection between these truths and how a citizen in Christ should live their life. And he says, therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being in spirit, being one in spirit and of one mind. Paul here gently and beautifully describes the ethical transformation which comes from being in Christ. Notice he doesn't come down on them in, with guilt, with a ton of bricks. He doesn't question if they really believe the gospel. Notice he doesn't say, be perfect and never make a mistake, otherwise you'll let the team down and God will be disappointed in you. Notice he doesn't say that you have to earn your way to become a God's child. No, he's gently saying that you, it's gently using the union with Christ, union with, union with his spirit as a basis of ethical transformation. If this faith in Christ has touched you, if this is connected with you, which if you're in Christ, then no doubt it has, then make Paul's joy complete by letting it permeate and transform you. He draws on the same love, spirit and mind in which the Philippians stand, the same spirit, love and mind which comes from deep connection with Christ. And it's these deep, profound spiritual resources which leads to ethical transformation to lead a worthy life in Christ. It's not by willpower, not by magic, not through special programs. It's built on the love of Christ, the spirit of Christ, the tenderness and compassion of Christ. Because you are one with Christ, you live like him. And so then Paul explains specifically what it means to live a life worthy of this connection with Christ. And see there in verses 3 to 4, it's entirely consistent with the Christ that they've been joined with. Um, verse 3 to 4. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but live a life of humility. The overarching virtue described there is humility. Humility is at the heart of a life worthy of the gospel. But what exactly is humility? Humility is often described as having low self-regard or a sense of unworthiness. But I think that this can misrepresent humility. For this kind of view can mistake humility for low self-esteem. For humility is not having low self-regard and thinking of yourself as useless. But it's a grounded sense of self-regard. Humility indicates a certain sense of connection with reality, a groundedness would actually make sense because the term humility is actually derived from the word humus, meaning earth. Now, not hummus. I just want to make that clear. It doesn't come from hummus. That's a dip. But humus. The gardeners amongst us will be able to understand what humus is. It's with earth, meaning earth. It's a groundedness. And humility is also particularly defined in relation to others. Value others above yourself. Not looking to your own interests, but each to the interests of the others. Some have said that humility is not thinking less of yourself, it is thinking of yourself less. Both of these paintings are entitled 
humility. I wonder why. What do you think? Perhaps it's the the demeanour, the simplicity, the groundedness, the lack of selfish ambition or vain conceit. I don't know. They're both paintings of humility. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. Humility built on the spirit and love of Christ is at the heart of a life worthy of the gospel. Yet it can be hard to live with humility in our world. For our world is becoming increasingly self-focused. Disney movies keep telling us to be true to yourself, being authentic, um, you know, living our authentic lives. But unfortunately, without a sense of groundedness or humility, this philo- philosophy can lead to deep insecurity and narcissism. Indeed, studies have shown that university students today display much higher levels of narcissism in the 1980s. It also leads to a great desire then to look good and project a positive image. In fact, in the course of their lifetime, the average millennial will take over 25,000 selfies. (laughs) This cultural experience has even unfortunately permeated the church. Now, last year I listened to the podcast... The Rise and Fall of Mars Hill. I'm not sure if anyone's ever heard of that or if you even use podcasts. But, uh, but anyway, this story documented the awful story. Uh, I mentioned uh, this last week, alluded to this last week, but, but this documented the awful story of lead pastor Mark Driscoll and, and the mega church that he created in Seattle in the US. And the podcast, well, there's lots of stories, but one story in particular was, it was sharing when Mark Driscoll was doing preaching engagement in London. And then to demonstrate perhaps some of the celebrity culture after the event a few people were wait, you know after this christian event you know he's gone and spoken a few people were waiting outside to get driscoll's autograph and photo taken with him and as they drove away a colleague expressed amazement that a pastor a pastor would get this kind of celebrity response and in reply driscoll says i don't know if you've noticed or not but i am kind of a big deal Mark Driscoll had preached sermons on humility. He'd extolled the virtues of humble service. He preached strongly against pride. And I'm sure he thought he was a humble person. But the capacity for human self-deception can be enormous. Indeed, it was the pride and the lack of humility in Mark Driscoll, which was one of the key reasons that the Mars Hill Church collapsed almost overnight and shipwrecked the faith of many. He did not live a life worthy of, this, as a, as a, of a citizen of Christ or take heed of Paul's exhortations here. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Now, I must confess, it's, it's nice to be liked. Nice to be seen as remotely competent. It's pleasing when people compliment you. But it can lead to pride. You do start thinking maybe you are a big deal. Then you worry what people will think about you, which can lead to insecurity and defensiveness. And then you're less open to criticism. And you start doing things to further your own interests. And you start getting less interested in others. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Humility built on the love of Christ is at the heart of living a worthy life as a citizen of Jesus. So does this then for men that I shouldn't try to be successful or build a reputation or a profile or even share my successes or achievements? This passage shows that motivations are crucial. Do nothing out of selfish ambition. There's nothing wrong with being successful or achieving great things or growing a great garden or doing whatever you do well. But if you're successful or simply selfish or for vain reasons, then that's a problem. So maybe then to test our motivations, maybe it's worthwhile just maybe once, not sharing, not sharing about or talking with something that you've achieved. Just keep it quiet so that only the Lord knows about your achievement or success. Because in humility, you value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. One simple way of implementing this is maybe through our conversations. 
Now, many, many conversations in the, in the modern world are, character, are not characterised by listening, but they're characterised by waiting. Just waiting for the other person to finish so that then I can start talking again. Maybe, so maybe something as simple as our conversations are a small way of valuing others above ourselves and considering the stories of others maybe more important than what I really feel like I need to say. <clears throat> and humility always welcomes feedback and criticism. We seem to live in a culture which shies away from criticism, for people take it as a personal affront. Now, I make mistakes. I am not perfect. But that's okay because I'm in Christ. The source of our identity, the motivation for our humility in Christ, his love and his spirit. And we learn as we live and live as worthy citizens of Christ, we can be inspired by the world's greatest example of humility. And we'll discover who that is next week, but spoiler alert... It's actually Jesus. It's actually Jesus Christ, the one who left heavenly glory and splendor and humbled himself to death on a cross. But his life is the life of the suffering, humble servant, and that is the true life worthy of the gospel. Because when we live a life worthy of the gospel of Christ, we become more like Christ himself. So maybe this helps us appreciate a little more of why suffering is a gift. Because maybe suffering helps us to become a little more humble and a bit more like Christ. For Christ is the greatest example of humility. And the church father Augustine said, The way of Christ is first through humility, second through humility, third through humility. If humility does not proceed and accompany and follow every work we do, if it is not before us to focus on, if it is not beside us to lean upon, if it is not behind us to fence us in, pride will wrench from our hand any good deed we do at the very moment we do it. The life worthy of a citizen of Christ. Because of your connection with Christ, live in unity with love and humility considering others. So this is what it means to live a life worthy of being a citizen of Christ, the humble servant king. It's about being tenacious, standing for Christ in the face of opposition, but it's about love. It's about humility, doing nothing out of selfish ambition, but looking to the interests of others. This is what it means to wear the shirt of Team Jesus. Indeed, this person here was actually one person who did wear the shirt for Jesus, was Brazilian footballer Kaká. He was an incredible football player and when he won the 2007 FIFA World Player of the Year, Brazilian legend Pelé describes him as the complete player. Yet Kaká was also, well he's also an evangelical Christian and this was said about him in an interview in 2007. They said, one of the things that makes Kaká stand out from the rest is his genuine humility. The 25-year-old man is a man of principle and somehow manages to stay true to his beliefs in a world in which money is king. That alone makes him refreshingly different and the manner in which he conducts himself and lives his life should be an example to every aspiring player. They could learn a great deal by studying Kaká's behaviour on and off the pitch. Uh, he, or the, the quote goes on. Living the proper way, playing football in the correct manner and staying in touch with his faith are what matters most to UEFA's Player of the Year. That's why alcohol and tobacco companies, with all their millions, have failed to persuade Kaká to endorse any of their products. Kaká really does belong to Jesus. He knows what is a life worthy of his citizenship with Jesus. Now, his life certainly hasn't been perfect, but he does belong to Jesus, and he lives a life of principle, love, grace and humility so may we be inspired in whatever our context to stand for jesus expect suffering for jesus but be worthy of the shirt by living with humility and love to his glory amen let's pray father we thank you for jesus for his gospel, for the gift of faith in him, and for the gift of suffering for him. We pray that we may be united in your gospel, and please help us to stand for you in one spirit and mind. 
Thank you for reminding us of who we are in Christ and may the humility of Christ guide and shape us to live as worthy citizens of Jesus now and forevermore. Amen. Please take a seat. Philippians 2, 1 to 4 says, Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. Let's pray. Father, may we go from here remembering our union with Christ, comforted by his love, empowered by our sharing in your spirit, and may we live lives worthy as your citizens in Christ. Amen.